This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by God Bless the Dead by Evan Geller, the first book in the Koda trilogy. Indie Reads calls the book an entertaining read with engaging characters and an intricate plot with plenty of action and plot twists. Learn more over at thegoatrodeoblog.com. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 467 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is F. Brett Cox. He's the Charles A. Dana Professor of English at Norwich University and author of the short story collection The End of All Our Exploring. Together with Andy Duncan, he edited the anthology Crossroads, Tales of the Southern Literary Fantastic, which includes stories by Michael Bishop, Kelly Link, and Gene Wolfe. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new book, Roger Zelazny, Modern Masters of Science Fiction. And today's show is brought to you by God Bless the Dead by Evan Geller, the first book in the Koda Trilogy, a series of speculative novels combining hard science fiction with a modern-day retelling of the Fenian cycle of Irish mythology. And here's a description of the book. It says, When a struggling grad student develops a practical method to interpret meaning in brain electrical activity, the world is confronted with the death of lies, the tyranny of truth, and the realization that some truths are too dangerous to reveal. Combining hard science with reasoned speculation, God Bless the Dead asks a fundamental question. What happens when we discover scientific evidence of what awaits us beyond death? Rebecca's Reed says, God Bless the Dead encompasses the best of almost every single literary genre. There's intrigue, espionage, drama, medical, technical slash science fiction, plus there's even a beautiful love story swirled around in the mix. Don't get me wrong, God Bless the Dead was not a perfect book, but it was pretty darn close. So again, the book is called God Bless the Dead by Evan Geller, and it's available now on Amazon in both Kindle and print editions, as well as for Nook and Apple eBooks. All proceeds from the book will be donated to the National Alliance on Mental Illness in the U.S. and to SANE in the U.K. And you can learn more over at thegoatrodeoblog.com. And if you want to get the word out about your own book, movie, event, or product on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, you can learn more about that over at geeksguideshow.com slash ads. And now here's our interview with F. Brett Cox. All right, so we're here with F. Brett Cox. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so you just published a book about Roger Zelazny. So how'd that come about? Well, um, as is often the case in life, it was all Gary Wolf's fault. Um, mm -hmm. Gary is um, someone, for anyone who may not be as familiar with the field, Gary is a longtime uh, uh, academic and uh, a longtime columnist for Locus Magazine. And uh, one year at the International Conference on the Fantastic in the Arts, which is one of the places I see um him and a lot of other people um, each year. Uh, he asked me, uh, he mentioned to me about the what was then this new line from University of Illinois Press uh, called Modern Masters of Science Fiction. And he said, you should write something for that. You should send in a proposal. And he introduced me to the um, in-house editor uh, of the project who at that time, and I'm checking in my own acknowledgements because I want to make sure to, it's been uh, quite um, a while. Willie, it was a man named William Rieger, and we talked a bit, and Zelazny's name came up. So after the conference, I did a formal proposal, and it was accepted. And, uh, you know, this is how uh, the academic works uh, usually go. You have to turn in a very detailed proposal and they get two anonymous outside readers to review the proposal. And uh, that all fell into place. And then uh, more years later than I will ever admit hmm. publicly, it's done. Um, so uh, that was what started it. And of course, I suggested Zelazny's name because uh, he was someone who was a crucial figure to me um, as a very young reader of uh, science fiction. And that uh, if it was something that uh, uh, I felt I felt a very uh, strong investment in doing. 
So you say in the acknowledgments, you, you mentioned that you went to Syracuse University and University of Maryland, because I guess they have mm-hmm. Zelazny collections there? Yes, they are, there are pre- collections of Zelazny's paper at both of those institutions in their uh, library, each of the university's library special collections uh, sections. Um, and the, the Baltimore uh, makes sense because, of course, Zelazny lived in Baltimore for quite a while, and he wrote most of his best-known early works while he was living in Baltimore uh, before he moved to Santa Fe. And uh, why there are Zelazny (laughs) papers specifically at Syracuse, I don't know. Um, Now, someone told me, and if if I were writing this down in the book, I wouldn't dare put this down until I could confirm it, but I heard secondhand that there was a time uh, several decades ago, really, that uh, the science fiction writers of America was trying to develop collections of science fiction writers' papers at various universities. And so there is Lasney and there are a few other uh, science fiction writers whose papers are there at Syracuse. And the papers at Syracuse are from earlier in his career, going up to about the early, you know, into the 1970s, and the papers at Baltimore uh, are from a somewhat later time. So could I just roll in and check those out, or do you have to have uh, like special permission or... Well, uh, you know, they don't keep them in a closely guarded vault, but (laughs) they're not out there on the shelf for anybody to peruse either. What you have to do is to contact the special collections office at both of those places and just say, I want to come in and examine the Rogers Lasney papers and you have to make an appointment. And then when you get there, they've got these huge boxes, uh, file boxes of papers lined up on a book cart. And then you have to stay there and examine them. And, um, you know, just uh, it, it's it is very uh, very organized. So um, you do, you can't just walk in off the street and <laughs> demand to see, uh, you know, uh, Zelazny's correspondence with his agent. But, but it is there and it is there for public access. And if you do all those things, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't see why they wouldn't let you take <laughs> a look at them. Yeah. I mean, so so when you uh, started looking through all that stuff, was it kind of what you had the way that you had imagined, or was was it unexpected in any way? Um, that's an interesting question because I'm not sure what I imagined. Uh, they, now I knew well, I knew what was there because the items are cataloged. So I knew going in that you know in this box there was going to be, say the the manuscript copy of. Um, he, the novella He Who Shapes, which a manuscript would have been under its original title, The Ides of October. Um, there were, uh, so there were manuscript things uh, like that. There was correspondence uh, in there, which I also expected. There were things that uh, surprised me a little bit. There were flyers from conventions where Zelazny had been a guest. Um, there were uh, there was, but it was mostly just um, manuscripts and correspondence, which is what I was, you know, what I was uh, looking for. And I got it was just fascinating. I spent uh, two or th- two or three days in each location, uh, just spending the day, uh, or at least a long afternoon, uh, sitting there going through the material. Yeah, I mean, it sounds really exciting. Now, I, I told you uh, over email that Roger Zelazny was my favorite author growing up. So mm-hmm. just the thought of being able to look through his correspondence and things is, is just so cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, it, it was very, it was, it, it was very cool. And it, I could have spent far more time there than I did, but I spent enough and I, I got a lot of very useful material. Yeah. And I guess I had never really, until I read your book, I guess I had never really consciously realized how private of a person he was. I mean, you mentioned that he never really talked about his his family life or his political views or or anything like that publicly. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, one point I make in the book is that he's a very, he was very 
Uh, of course, he was always um, linked with Samuel R. Delaney, and, and I do try to talk about that in the book. And he was also uh, good friends with Harlan Ellison. And it's an interesting contrast because these um, three writers, I mean, Ellison was a little older than the other two, but they were still, you know, strong contemporaries and very well known. And of course, we all know how much Harlan Ellison uh, wrote about himself. <laughs> and uh, of course, Delaney has done extensive uh, memoir writing. And uh, so, but Zelazny Del just didn't. I should toss in that Zelazny was, uh, I talked to people who, as much as I could, who knew Zelazny among people I know or people I had access to. Um, and uh, it really was a strikingly universal consensus how well regarded he was personally. And the, nobody had a bad word to say about him. And that was very nice uh, to learn. Uh, but they also several people did note that, as the saying goes, he kept himself to himself. He uh, there was always a little bit of distance there, and he just really was not he was not given to the autobiographical essay. You know, I have two other biographies of him that you you mm -hmm. mentioned the uh, mm -hmm. on my shelf here the the Linsgold one and the Krulik one. Right. Um, could you talk about like what was. Um, like, what were you trying to do differently than the um, biographies that already existed? Um, well, for openers, I was trying to do just do a new one, because the po point I make in the introduction is that there had been when Zelazny died, uh, there was, uh, I think, an assumption that there was going to be this continual uh, flood or at least a healthy river of academic uh, study of his work. And, and, you know, to be honest, there really wasn't. So I wanted to write something that was new. Um, I thought it was important. Um, to, I thought it was important that there be something about Zelazny by somebody who did not know him. And I say that with considerable regret. I as I mentioned briefly in the acknowledgments, and we can go into more detail about this later, but I met Roger Zelazny when I was a teenager at a science fiction convention, just very briefly. And so technically I met him, but I did not know him uh, in my own adulthood or after I became professionally active in the field. And so I thought, I really thought that there needed to be a book by somebody who could take a step back. Maybe I'm emulating Zelazny there trying to, <laughs> you know, keep a little bit of distance, but I think that's important. And for what it's worth, I think that's going to be important moving forward. We've talked about Harlan Ellison, for example. Uh, I'm waiting for the study of Harlan Ellison's work written by somebody who never met him, <laughs> and, yeah. which is kind of hard to come by these days because we all met Harlan <laughs> along the way sooner, you know, one way or the other. So, and that was a, and, and that was a part of it. And I also wanted to um, interrogate this received notion that Selassie did all this brilliant work early on, and then he just hacked himself out, and there was nothing that came afterward measured up, really, to the early work. I just always thought that was, at the best, an oversimplification, and I was convinced there was, you know, more to be said about that. And I'm not saying that Krulik or Ledskull bought into that uh, at all, but, you know, they published uh, those books um Both of those books appeared when Zelazny uh, was still alive, and so... I thought it was time for time for a new one, and I hope there will be more. To, and I hope there will be more to follow. My book is not at all a comprehensive study. There's a lot more to talk about, and both uh, the, what I do have, what I would claim solidarity with Krulik and Lindskull, uh, is that all three of these books are really biographically based career surveys. Um, I did not have the time or resources uh, or the charge, really, from the publisher to do any kind of comprehensive biography. So I really do think of my book, certainly, as more of a, career, a biographically based uh, career survey. 
Yeah. So let me talk about, so my experience was, you know, I discovered just randomly at the bookstore, I discovered the guns of Avalon when I was about mm -hmm. 12 or 13 mm -hmm. and it just became my favorite book. And I just read it over and over and over dozens of times. Oh, and... I know what that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, I was just at the supermarket at some point and they had night of shadows, which is the, I, I guess I should say guns of Avalon is the second book in the Amber right. series and mm -hmm. night of shadows is the ninth. So I went yeah. from reading the second one to the ninth. And then I read them all in kind of random order. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and so then I read all of those many, many times. And then I mm -hmm. sort of branched out to Zelazny's other uh, works from there. But for me, the Amber books are always like my first mm -hmm. love. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it just, it wounds me when people talk about those as his, um, you know, the as his decline, basically, because mm -hmm. I, I love them so much. So mm -hmm. I, I would certainly join you in, in sort of pushing back against mm -hmm. that narrative that um, right. I think there's mm -hmm. a lot more to say about. Oh, well, I'm glad you said that. And you are not alone. Um, I particularly with younger readers and writers, uh, there are a lot of people who, well, well like the, I, I quoted from a few younger writers uh, at the end of the book about how Zelazny had influenced their work. And I know full well that with at least one of them, and maybe all of them, that Amber was the gateway, right? Amber, the Amber books were what brought them in. And I think, and as you saw in the book, and I, I hope, and I would actually be interested to know, because I tried to be as um, even-handed as I could, particularly with the second half of the Amber series, with um, uh, you know the ones that he wrote after those, the the second five uh, books, and uh, I hope that I, you know, did them justice. But reading, at least as an adult reader, reading those books for me was never uh, quite. It was a different reading experience than reading the first five. And in fact, I you know, came to his work through, uh, or, you know, at an earlier time through earlier works, um, through Lord of Light, and in particular through the, his uh, story arose for Ecclesiastes, which, uh, if you, re you know, you read the, if you, if you're 14 years old and you're already wanting to be a writer and you read that story, it hits you hard. I don't see how it can't, frankly. And so that was my gateway to him. And one thing I discovered in doing the book is that particularly the first of the Amber books, Nine Princes in Amber, I found a lot more in that book than I did when I first read it. I think it's just a, a remarkable piece of work. Well, yeah, uh, let me give you my impression of the Amber series, because I guess, I, I, as I said, I just read it so many times. And it's, sure. it's in my in my mind, it's inconsistent. I mean, some mm -hmm. of the books I, are much, much better than others mm -hmm. to my mind. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, sort of the so the, the first five are told from the point of view of a character named Corwin, and then the second five are told from the point of view of his son, Merlin. And mm -hmm. it's just conventional wisdom that the second five are just like, not, not good. Um, and I don't agree with that at all. My, my take is that it's you, you start off with Nine Princes in Amber, and I think it's a little bit wonky, honestly, at the beginning. It's like kind of mm -hmm. obvious he's making up but as, as he goes along and um, the style is kind of all over the place. And it sort of settles down by the end. And this part where Corwin is in the Dungeons of Amber is just mm -hmm. one of the best things I've ever read. I think it's so mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And oh. then then that continues. And the, uh, then I love all of the Guns of Avalon and then Sign of the Unicorn. You, you have this up, up until the part where they kind of like rescue brands, I guess, a little, mm -hmm. get a little spoilery, but yeah. like that, that sweep there is, is just one of my favorite things I've ever read. Maybe my favorite thing I've ever read. Yeah. And then it gets a little bit more conventional um, toward the end of Sign of the Unicorn and then Hand of Oberon. And then Court to Chaos, I don't think is very good at all. Like I was never even able to finish it as a kid. And mm -hmm. so then I think that when the second series starts up, it gets, it's a significant improvement over Courts of Chaos. And I think the mm -hmm. first three are, are really, you know, they're not as good as the earlier books, but they're, they're pretty good. And then, then that series kind of goes off the tracks for me with Night of Shadows, where it's like, um, you know, we, we had this whole thing built up with Luke and Julia and Ghost Wheel. And then right. it, all of a sudden it's kind of like, oh, wait, wait, I've got another idea. And then we kind of go off in this completely separate story for mm -hmm. the last two books. And so so both both of those five book sequences to me, like start out strong and kind of like peter yeah. out by the end. 
Right. And right. the second mm -hmm. one peters out more quickly. But I think that mm -hmm. the beginning of the second sequence to me is a lot stronger than the end of the first sequence. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think, uh, no, I, I take your point on all of that. I think uh, to go back to something you said earlier, I'm fascinated by the idea of reading the books out of order. And I think that would be a really interesting way to encounter them. Uh, well, for one thing that you get, and this is something I discuss in the book, is that if you've got a long series of books that you are kind of stuck with making sure that the person like you, who may pick one out of order and just kind of read it randomly, has enough information to know what's going on. And so that can be a little bit burdensome for people who have already read the other books, uh, just the sort of, you know, in our last uh, episode. Yeah. And I think that, um, uh, but on the other hand, and also there, as you say, there's just, um, I don't worry about plot spoilers uh, with the Amber series, because if you reveal one plot point, there are 20 others that, <laughs> not, that you have not revealed. And so it kind of balances out. And that started uh, to me to get a bit out of control, uh, you know, at certain points in, in the series. And again, you know, this is all uh, stuff I try to uh, cover in the book, but there are really interesting things in the second part of the series. Um, I think that it's interesting how it kind of shifts with the times, you know, when the original Amber book started appearing in the 70s. You had Corwin, who on earth was a songwriter, and then the book started appearing in the late 80s. Uh, am I remembering this correctly? In the later 80s yeah. for the second part. And, you know, Merlin is a computer guy. Uh, so he's kind of moved up into the real world. Uh, there's still interesting technical things in there. There's one point in, I think it is in Night of Shadows, where uh, Merlin has come into possession of some sort of artifact that change that really changes his personality. But this is reflected in a shift in tone in the language in the book. And the Merlin is telling that part of the story sounds really different than the Merlin who is telling other parts of the story. But Zelazny there, it doesn't make that explicit until later on. Uh, so the, he's he was on one of the points I try to make in the book. He always wanted to try something new. He was always teaching himself, learning about things, even in and out of the standalone novels that didn't get a lot of love uh, in the 70s and 80s. He was still doing innovative things uh, with uh, narrative structure. And there, there's some of that going on, too. And I re I'm very glad you mentioned the part in Nine Princes in Amber when Corwin was in, uh, in prison, because that really is a both a powerful and a powerfully effective sequence. And I had kind of the same response to the confrontations that um, Merlin has with his mother, Dara, uh, later in the second series. I thought there was an emotional honesty there. Uh, that was very effective. And if you read, so if you put them in the context of Zelazny's uh, overall work, they're, they're all sorts of things that you can see. I mean, going back to this notion of what constitutes the Zelazny hero, you know, and the way that Merlin kind of goes back to that, but then um, maybe doesn't in some ways. So, so there's plenty of interest in in the second series uh, of the Amber books, especially if you are familiar with Zelazny's other work. Yeah. Well, I want to just explain for people who haven't read the books, just that the basic premise of the Amber series is it's like, imagine if you could just use your mind to change details uh -huh. of the environments uh -huh. around you as you walk. Uh -huh. And each uh -huh. time you do that, you're shifting into a slightly different parallel world. Uh -huh. And by this accretion of these details, you can just end up in any kind of world that you can imagine. Right. And I just think that's such a great, such a great oh, idea. Oh, it's it's utterly compelling. And I think there's, you know, there's no arguing with success. And um, it was, I actually rather enjoyed getting into the, just the, com in the book, just the commercial aspects of, of really what became the Amber subculture. I mean, like, as we said, there are people who knew Zelazny through Amber, the same way that there are people who, 
maybe uh, if they know Stephen King, it's through the Dark Tower books, and they don't haven't really read much of the other stuff. Um, uh, so, um, the, so yeah, the, the Amber, there is no, uh, you know, get no getting away um, yeah, from Amber, and there is uh, a lot to be. Uh, to be enjoyed there. Uh, in particular, going back to Nine Princes in Amber, I also have as one of my favorite interludes in a Zelazny book, when uh, in the first book they are making the first journey to Amber from the Shadow Earth and the landscape starts changing around them. Uh, you know, that that was just lovely. Yeah. I mean, but it's so interesting to read your book because there's this, you know, at the same time that the critics are kind of turning up their nose at Zelazny and saying, oh, this is just old hat. This is the same thing he's written before. Mm -hmm. You have fans like he's like mobbed at conventions mm -hmm. by fans and mm -hmm. people are having Amber themed weddings and, mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. It's like this mm -hmm. weird you know, bifurcation of, uh, of the responses. I know one thing you learn in both doing critical work on fiction and, um, and it's something you very useful to, to remember if you write fiction too. And that's another thing I, I hope I have brought to this a little bit is that I write fiction as well. And I had a short story collection published uh, a couple of years ago. I, there is often a gap between what we as uh, academics or critics or whatever uh, th want literature to do and what literature actually does. And I think that the Amber series is a very good example of what literature can actually do, that it gives the, it gives the readers a world uh, to lose themselves in and to be a part of and uh, th that it just uh, it just hooks them. Yeah. And as you said, make the ability to make these choices, the ability. I never really thought of this before, but when you were talking about just the ability to change your environment, what it does is give is give you a scenario within which it's possible to have that kind of control over the world and who has control over the world. Not me. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's very strong stuff and it certainly did, uh, did well for him. Well, yeah. When people, sometimes people say, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? And people say, I could fly or like well, super strong or something. And it's like, no, no, to be able to walk in shadow, that's the mm -hmm. best superpower you could possibly have. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, again, just the, and the way he presented those interludes, um, in the book, uh, that really gave him a chance to, to exercise his lyrical impulses. All those, you know, stretches, uh, you remember where there are just these fragmentary descriptions and ellipses and, and, and all that. Well, so, um, so yeah, so again, the, the sort of conventional wisdom is that, he wrote the Amber series as kind of a turn toward a conscious turn toward be, being more commercial. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of things that I think don't really track with that. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of what's your, what's your impression? Well, the, um, that was another interesting discovery for me is that people, well, to go again, to go back to that period there, that's where nine princesses Amber in Amber was published in 1970. And a lot of people did see that as a conscious effort on Zelazny's part to move toward more commercial writing, because it also was in the same general time frame when he became a full-time writer. He had had a full-time career job at the Social Security Administration in Baltimore, and when he started doing well with his writing, he packed that in, and he was a full-time writer the rest of his life. But what you find uh, interesting is that there was, and for reasons I discuss in the book, uh, there for a couple of specific reasons, there was a, a delay between when he wrote Nine Princes in Amber and when it was published. And Nine Princes in Amber, he started pretty much right after he finished writing Lord of Light. And so it was not, it was a book he wrote because he wanted to write it. And I think that the results, you know, well, we see uh, what the results were. And he did some remarkably interesting things with, particularly in that first book, with uh, the conventions of 
sword and sorcery fiction. But he he was writing that book in um, I tried to establish a public a, a compositional timeline based on what I had found uh, in other sources about the order in which he wrote of uh, those books. And he was, um, you know, he he wrote War Flight and then he wrote um Nine Presses in Amber, and then there's Isle of the Dead, and there's a novelization of Damnation Alley, and interspersed with all of this, he's work, he's sort of uh, noodling on creatures of light and darkness here and there. So um, there was, so I think that the, I think it is a mistake to say that he wrote Nine Princes in Amber purely out of a commer- out of purely commercial interests whereas by the time you get to the later books for better or worse whatever you think of it there was a very strong commercial imperative uh, for him to write those later books well and i definitely i want to get to that but with nine princes in amber apparently he wrote it and just kind of like stuck it in a drawer and didn't yeah. show it to mm-hmm. anyone so That's right. that doesn't seem like something you do for commercial purposes. No, no, no. He uh, this is before uh, I was very struck by a quote he made. He did. I found from him later in his career when at some point he swore he would never again write another bo- another novel unless he had a contract in hand for it. And then he will. He just cheerfully ignored that whenever it suited him. <laughs> but he um, but yeah, at this point, you know, he was writing because he wanted to write things. He wanted to to try different things. And there's um, another point that uh, actually Jane Linskold, who wrote the third uh, book, there, there were actually, in terms of monograph studies of Zelazny, there was a very, there was an early one from uh, Carl Yoke, who was a longtime uh, academic in science fiction studies and was also a close friend of Zelazny. They grew up together in Ohio. And then there was Krulik's book and then there was Lynn School's book. Uh, but there's a quote from Lynn School in her introduction to one of the volumes of the Nesva Press Collected Stories. And she says her assertion is that Zelazny wrote some of these seemingly more conventional fantasy tales or sword and sorcery tales because he liked that stuff. He grew up reading it. He genuinely loved that particular branch of genre fiction. And he, he wrote it again. He wrote it because he wanted to. Yeah, I guess I'll say, you know, um, I used to volunteer uh, at David Hartwell's house for the New York review of science fiction. Oh, oh okay. I- so the, you were at, uh, you were at uh, Grand Central Command, <laughs> right, right there. <laughs> well, and, yes. and I talked to him. I, oh, sorry. I, I wish I could remember the numbers, but I, I think he he told me that you know he told Roger Zelazny I could give you like a five thousand dollar advance for a non amber book, or like a hundred thousand dollar advance for a mm-hmm. for an amber mm-hmm. for amber more amber books. Right. So like when it's that like level of difference, you know, like. Like, what are you going to do? Right, um, right. The um, There was a quote, uh, passage I found, and I'm not, I can't remember if I included it in the book because I can't remember if I was ever able to source it, but um, the quote was attributed to Zelazny that um, for one of his later novellas that was very well received, and he said that was a very good story. I'm very proud of it. It won an award. That was great. And the last Amber volume put a wing on my house. You know, so yeah. there are those considerations, and I'm uh, I'm and you know I I do quote that I knew I knew David fairly well, and I I've been in that house, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, he, you know, Zelazny was a professional writer. And I think that that's another thing that is interesting to me, deeply interesting, because Lasney is so firmly as identified, particularly with the early work, as this literarily ambitious writer, which he was. This writer who had a master's degree in comparative literature from Columbia University, which he did. Um, but he was still... He studied the markets. He knew the markets. He never stopped keeping up with the field, which I found very admirable uh, on discovering that. 
So he knew what was what in terms of his uh, status as a professional writer. And he was very careful uh, about all of that. Yeah. And if I, you know, as I said, I love the Amber books so much, but then I also love his short fiction. You know, you mentioned the Nestle Press. I have all all six of those here. Mm -hmm. I read them all. And I mean, I, that is sort of, um, you know, a, a bit of a tragedy to me that it seems like he wanted to write more short fiction and it just couldn't mm -hmm. justify it yeah. financially. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like he was, you know, it, he was much more suited to write writing shorter things that... Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. pretty much, I mean, many, 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 many of his things that I've read would benefit from being shorter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, and that's very interesting you say that because one thing I encountered was sometimes some complaints about some of those standalone novels from the 1970s and 80s being insufficiently developed, uh, that they are uh, people thinking that, um, you know, there was, uh, there needed to be more. Uh, to them, but I think that yeah, there are. Are Slasny was such a careful craftsman, and there, you know, there are places here or there that um, he could certainly uh, stand maybe to go back and uh, do a bit more uh, with it uh, on that level. But you know, I mean, we uh, it's very it's also easy to get into the on the historical treadmill of this critical response to Zelazny versus the response of his readers and um, uh, and all of that. But I, I don't want to lose sight of just what you were saying is those amazing shorter works. And uh, a very good way to sample them is uh, a recent small press book uh, that from uh, Warren Lapine uh, put together and that Delaney wrote an introduction to called The Magic. And it's uh, most of those major early novelettes and um, novellas, uh, and, but arose for Ecclesiastes and He Who Shapes, uh, This Moment of the Storm, which also knocked me out uh, when I read it as a, a very young reader. Um, all of those were, were really, they just, nobody had seen anything quite like that when those stories appeared. It really did feel like, uh, even though they were very, Tr grounded, deeply grounded in very traditional science fiction scenarios. Uh, I mean, come on, Rose for Ecclesiastes is about sentient Martians. But, mm -hmm. um, but still, nobody had seen anything quite like that before. Yeah. And then the other thing I want to mention that sort of cuts against Zelazny doing the Amber books as a purely commercial enterprise is mm -hmm. that he said that he didn't want anyone else writing Amber books. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he could have made a lot of money and had a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot more uh, attention over the succeeding decades if he had, you know, like, because you, you mentioned, I mean, it seems like people like George R. R. Martin, Neil mm -hmm. Gaiman, you know, Scott Lynch, Jim Butcher would all have been enthusiastic, enthusiastic to continue the story. And um, it seems like he just didn't want people doing that purely for personal artistic mm -hmm. reasons. Yeah. And I think that I'm glad you brought that up because it is also easy to think of him of just, uh, you know, cashing the checks when it came to stuff from the Amber. And as I mentioned in the book, there was a lot of apparatus that went with the whole Amber series. But the one thing he would not do was let anybody else write Amber stories, uh, at least in his lifetime. Uh, that did not happen. So he, uh, so um, good for him, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But you're right. Uh, and you mentioned Martin and Gaiman. I, I think that it is important to note, again, in terms of Zelazny's influence on other writers, that, of course, well, Mar well, they were both personal friends with Zelazny, and Martin knew him well in um when they were both they both lived in New Mexico and Zelazny was very, particularly a very much a mentor figure uh to Martin and they there is a a level of um just love for Zelazny's work among so many people and many of them are themselves very highly regarded and successful writers 
Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, have, you know, growing up with him is my favorite author and I'm talking about him all the time. And it's mm-hmm. really rare that I meet anyone out who's not a science fiction writer or like outside of a science fiction mm-hmm. convention mm-hmm. who's that familiar with him. Mm-hmm. And so I was really struck. There's a part in the book you quote where Philip K. Dick says to Zelazny, at this point, I have no doubt that you will or have already displaced Bradbury as the finest SF and fantasy writer. You will be remembered the most out of all of us. Mm hmm. And yeah, it's, <laughs> not it's exactly. Yeah. Not better remembered now than Phil no. K. Dick or oh, 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 no. Or... no, no, that's true. I think that, um, um, well, the, the the issue of literary reputation is endlessly complicated and endlessly fascinating. And what one of the things I try to, well, I'll go ahead and use the word that I try to admit in the afterward to the book is that I don't have a set answer for that because that it, that is just factually the case. If you look, you know, certainly Bradbury is still the science fiction writer. People know who, even if they don't read science fiction, and Philip K. Dick has has you know joined that uh, company as well, but. Uh, uh, but also, if you look at his contemporaries, that people like uh, Delaney, like Ursula Le Guin, um, like Joanna Russ, uh, preeminently like J.G. Ballard, um, gained reputations outside of science fiction. Michael Moorcock, you know, who who uh, did was very well known within contemporary British literature, and Selassie, you know, just really didn't and. I I don't know I don't have a set answer for that. He really the only two times he ever wrote anything really significant outside of science fiction fantasy is um his not the novel The Dead Man's Brother that was a crime novel that was not public that was only published posthumously and never sold in his lifetime and a novel he wrote in collaboration uh, with Gerard uh, uh, Hoffman called uh, Wilderness that was essentially a Western. It was an historical novel. It's a very interesting book, um, but he just didn't. He, he just didn't. And, um, you know, I think maybe there needs to be a more acute critical sensibility that can, or his more, a more comprehensive historian uh, who can give us more solid reasons for that? But you're right; nobody really knows Zelazny outside of uh, the uh, of the field and the way that they came to know Philip K. Dick or Ursula K. Le Guin. Yeah, well, well, let me run this by you. This is sort of my impression of why he's not um, in sort of a, a, as well known in academia as mm-hmm. as he might be. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, well, I mean, first of all, if you're talking about Samuel R. Delaney or Joanna Ross, those are people who had big presences mm-hmm. as academic, yes. you know, as critics themselves. Yes. So you would expect them to be better known to, mm-hmm. you know, to other academics. Mm-hmm. But, but I feel like also, I mean, you know, there, there, there's, there's sort of a, um, you know, there's been this longstanding reluctance in academia to embrace science fiction and fantasy, mm-hmm. which has, you know, gotten improved you know, a lot in recent years, Mm -hmm. but I still feel like a lot of academics, if they, if they're going to talk about science fiction, they kind of have to justify it. Right. uh, In their own minds or to their colleagues as like, it's not just like, this is a cool story. It's also, this has some sort of political angle or, Mm -hmm. you know, social commentary or something, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that Delaney and Le Guin and Russ, you know, fit really neatly into that. And that Zelazny being as sort of cagey about his politics and, and not being a political writer, particularly, it's it's like harder. It's harder to just you can't really justify him on that level. Mm-hmm. And it's more just like, I mean, you know, his, his work is full of allusions to different, you know, works of literature, which you think would be kind of like, you know, a lot of fun for for critics to dive into. But I think that, you know, the to me, the primary appeal of his work is that it's kind of like it's funny and it's cool and it's exciting and it's beautiful. And I feel like those are all things that are like, not what academic, like like what academia is set up to engage Mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's absolutely true that academia has, is looks far more kindly on science fiction than it used to. And the fact that I have tenure is proof of that. (laughs) So um, I'm not, that's a self-aggrandizing remark, but it's relevant. You know, I, um, we live in a world where uh, the most impressed 
uh, the one of my colleagues ever was with me was when I told her that I had met Michael Moorcock. And she was not, you know, a science fiction academic at all. So, so there is that. But uh, if what you know, if we if we grant you know what you're saying, what that makes me all the more eager that people consider what I am saying in this book, which is that there is a political dimension to what Zelazny was doing, because if you do look, particularly in the early works. The, he keeps coming back to as plot points to what today we would simply call political terrorism. I mean, you know, the title character in and Call Me Conrad, uh, to uh, in the novel To Die at Uh in what I think was one of his most interesting and um, in many ways underrated standalone novels in the 70s, Bridge of Ashes is about eco-terrorism. And so there is this dealing with, and of course, Sam uh, in Lord of Light, right? The Lord of Light him, uh, himself. So there is this awareness of and dealing with issues of political violence in his work and also into questions of how the individual stands within the community. Uh, one thing... Uh, Okay, I don't want to get too deep, too much into this because I'd want, but you can just go read the book. But, um, but what there is in his work, and this is in some ways maybe my central, if my book has a central thesis, is this, is that there's a continuity in his work of this dealing with issues of the individual in society operating within systems, and there is a move across the books from the earliest to the latest away from the notion of the alienated loner who's just going to blow everything up uh, if need be to somebody who sees himself as more of a larger community. And that's something that comes across by the time you get to the end of Doorways in the Sand, which, you know, is a very funny book. And it's a very, it's about as close as he ever came to writing an out-and-out -out comedy. And it's very much the case with a later standalone novel, Eye of Cat. And by the time you get to his final standalone novel, A Night in the Lonesome October, which for me was the nicest surprise of doing this book. Uh, it's a lovely book, uh, that novel. And by the time you get to that, uh, you've got, you don't really have a Zelazny hero at all. You've got a bunch of the voice of a servant who is trying to keep everything together. So, uh, so I would argue there is a political dimension to his work, and I hope that people will uh, explore that more thoroughly. Right, let's come back to that in a second. I'm just curious, this, the, the colleague you mentioned who was a big fan of Michael Moorcock, was mm -hmm. it like Elric or was it like New Worlds in the... Oh, it was um, all of it. Uh, I think that she had probably read the Ehrlich, Ehrlich novels and probably encountered the New Worlds uh, stuff. Um, it, I never, to be honest, uh, I never talked to her at great length about it. I just kind of said, oh, maybe things will be okay because this was like my first year on the faculty, <laughs> I thought. And uh, similarly, the very senior faculty member who um, was his office when I, my first couple of years uh, at Norwich University, his office was right across from mine. And the first time I walked in, the first thing I saw is that he had books uh, on his shelf by uh, Gene Wolfe and John Crowley. And so I thought, again, well, maybe this will work. So, so yeah, there is higher regard uh, that, but you're right. Moorcock's a good example of what we were talking about earlier is that you got people who are all about Ehrlich and uh, Elric, sorry. And people who are more about the, uh, the new world's thing. I mean, this is, they were like, they were like being denounced by parliament and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, that's one of my favorite fun facts in science fiction history is that when uh, Moorcock was editing New Worlds and they serialized Norman Spenrad's novel, Bug Jack Barron, and uh, it was denounced in Parliament uh, for publishing obscene material. Uh, so, uh, and Selassie was caught up in that too. I mean, he published a good bit of Creatures of Light and Darkness in New Worlds, and he published some of his short fiction uh, there. Um, but, 
very interesting moments in the correspondence I read at the uh, libraries uh, between Zelazny and Moorcock, where Moorcock was just saying, you know, give me more, <laughs> you know, write, <laughs> write something. It's stunning when you read through that, and I quoted a brief selection of this in the book, how highly the other writers of his day uh, regarded his work how the other writers in the 1960s were just absolutely astonished at what he was doing. Yeah. And I guess that was another thing that, that definitely that was an insight to me from your book was how, how much a part of his personality it was not to have anyone in a position of control over him mm -hmm. and to be mm -hmm. the sort to be sort of independent and, mm -hmm. and how in, in your view, right. The, the sort of the maturing of his viewpoint is, yes. is this realization. You can't just be like that forever, mm -hmm. that you have yeah. to kind of mm -hmm. knit yourself into a wider community. At right. Some point. Right. And I'm not, it, it, it will remain for somebody to, who to, to a write a real full length biography of Selesny, um and B consider if that, how that matched up with uh, with his own life but it it's just you read a lot of uh one writer's work uh over a long period of time and you inevitably start making connections and it just seemed to me almost glaringly obvious that there was this progression within Zelazny's protagonist that was heading in that direction. And he was very uh, strong individualist uh, in that regard. I think the most revealing aspect to that is that he was quite athletic, apparently, but he lettered in judo and fencing. He never did anything with team sports. It was the, the individual sports. And, and of course, that's why a lot of the combat scenes in um, his work are you know, based on uh, really um, expert knowledge on his part. And so you sort of say in the book that kind of the best, you think the best prospect for Zelazny, uh, for Zelazny coming to a, a wider audience is through some sort of like TV show or mm -hmm. movie or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's been movement in that direction. And in fact, I had to make a last minute, got my, my ever patient editors, uh, everybody, hmm. University of Illinois Press, should be canonized for this <laughs> year, but just for their patience in dealing with me uh, on this book. But I did work in a last minute mention in the footnote that, you know, there's just been announced in through multiple outlets that George R. R. Martin is going to be involved with turning Zelazny's novel, later novel, Roadmarks, into an HBO series. I think which is a great idea because that is a book that is very oh, literally set on an open highway with a lot of exits. And so it's just a great, um, I think, template for building a TV series around it. Uh, there was um, there a few years ago now, there was talk that Robert Kirkman, who did The Walking Dead, was wanting to do a miniseries of the Chronicles of Amber. And, um, you know, so there was, uh, so there have been hints that maybe uh, that would lead to some kind of larger awareness, which would be interesting and kind of ironic because Lasney was, didn't seem to be that interested in going Hollywood. I mean, he'd take their money when he had the chance, but he just didn't seem to be, um, you, you know, uh, ha have a sense of himself as a screenwriter uh, in the way that, that some other writers did. Well, right. you, you say that um, Gene Roddenberry offered him a chance to write a Star Trek script. Mm -hmm. And he was just kind of like, nah, I'm not interested. Yeah, the, I, I, you know, to this day, I find that I struggle to even believe that. But uh, it, it's, you know, it, it is, I found sources that said, that, you know, this is what happened. Uh, and that he, but so I could, so he did turn it down the same way. The only movie that ever got made out of his work was, uh, that his name was, uh, on the credits was the film version of Damnation Alley, which was famously bad. Uh, you know, it was just not a very good movie. And he was quoted as saying, well, you know, the, you know, I'll take their money and if they want to give me money again, I'll take it then. <laughs> so he, he he was uh, he was fair, seemed to be fairly sanguine about that. Well, right, and it, and it also seems to cut against again this idea of him as this like more commercial writer because it seems like he just mm -hmm. didn't want to write screenplays and mm -hmm. 
you know, the money was, you know, not, mm-hmm. not, yeah. not a factor. Yeah. There. I think that that's an important point. And in retrospect, um, you're now making me wish I had articulated this in the book, but it's just kind of coalescing, uh, talking with you about this is that, yes, he did stuff for commercial gain, but the stuff he did for commercial gain was stuff that he wanted to do, which is namely write stories. Okay, so he didn't, uh, if he turned down the chance to do uh, a screen uh, play, he, um, uh, you know, that was because he didn't want to do it. And again, to be fully um, on this topic, there is also he did do some screen script treatments for a movie that was using his novella, He Who Shapes, as source material. But it never really came to anything in terms of adapting that particular story, and he wasn't given uh, screen credit for uh, the movie that did result from that. So he was willing to try, but apparently, um, you know, it, it, uh, it just didn't happen. Yeah, but I would be really interesting, interested to see what would happen if there was a, a TV show or something. Because, you know, I've been a huge fan of George R. R. Martin since I read Sand Kings when I was, yeah, again, like oh, Sand King. You, Sand, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Sand Kings has one of the best opening paragraphs you could want. That story just hits the ground running at full speed and doesn't stop until the end. I, I reread it recently and I... I uh, and I was always very fond of the story. But yeah, Sand Kings is amazing. Yeah, no, I, I love it. But yeah, but so, you know, for like, whatever, 30 years or mm-hmm. so, 20 years, I, I was always, you know, talking about George R. R. Martin. And again, nobody outside of science fiction convention had any, any idea what I was talking about. Mm-hmm. And then there's a TV show. And granted, it was a very successful TV show. But then now everybody knows George R. Mm-hmm. Martin. So right. it'd be interesting to see if, you know, if something like that would happen with Celeste. Yeah. And of course, I think... Uh, of course, the Amber series would make great uh, episodic television. I think it would uh, it would be very entertaining to watch. And of course, I'm old enough to remember when Martin was writing stories for science fiction magazines for Nicola Words. So it has been quite <laughs> some quite something to watch all that happen. Yeah, um, we're almost out of time here. I guess I, okay. I wanted to mention that. That, um, you know, I've always wanted to visit Santa Fe because that's where Roger Selassie lives, you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, now that the pandemic's over, I'm planning to drive uh, to visit my parents in California. Where my girlfriend and I are planning to stop at Santa Fe. Along oh, the way. great. Uh, I've been there so, once um, on uh, my wife and I took a cross country driving trip a number of years ago. And we uh, stopped off in Santa Fe. It's beautiful. It's exactly what you want it to be, or at least it was uh, almost 20 years ago when uh, when I was there. Uh, go to the Chuck, if it's still there. Go to the Chuck Jones Museum. It, oh, it, interesting. They, it, there was a small museum that was devoted to uh, the animator Chuck Jones. Uh, so uh, yeah, Santa Fe is a very cool place. Is there anything from uh, from all this research you did on Roger Zelazny that gives you any ideas for stuff to check out in Santa Fe? Um, to be honest, not really, because um, the Zelazny's experience of Santa Fe was, um, of course, when he just so tragically died. And uh, that that's another, I'll just toss out, that's another thing I discovered in researching this, is what a gut punch it was to everybody who knew him and who read his work when he died, because it, it was um, unexpected. Nobody knew uh, exactly how sick he was. But when I was in Santa Fe, it was about 10 years after he died, and that was about 20 years ago, so I don't have any up-to-date stuff on Santa Fe. But I can't imagine that it's not still cool. So... I'm sure there'll be plenty to discover. Yeah, if anyone listening uh, has any suggestions, I mean, like um, I interviewed Melinda Snodgrass a, a little while yeah. ago, and mm-hmm. she she's, she mentioned like what street he lived on, and and there's right. you know, George R. Martin has his mm-hmm. um the the cocktail theater in town and stuff. So right, this right, all on my uh, agenda. Yeah, yeah, M- uh, Melinda is an ex. I'll, uh, I early on in the process of this book, I, I spoke with her uh, at least once about uh, Zelazny. She they were they were close friends, and um, 
you know, you get, you still get a sense, uh, uh, the sense of loss from people who knew him, uh, who um, just how unexpected, uh, unexpected that was. And uh, I'll maybe throw in one more thing here, because again, it's just coming to me that one of the things that you, you see about Selassie's work or that I discovered doing the book is that he was constantly trying to educate himself and trying something new. And to do that is to kind of assume that you're going to have time to apply what you learn. And I think that's one of the things that we just have to deal with. Uh, the, one of the most fascinating quotes I got from anybody was from Walter John Williams, who knew Zelazny well um, in there in New Mexico. And he said that Zelazny once talked to him about uh, f- several novellas that he wanted to write. And he died before he could write any of them. So um, that there's always a sense of, um, you know, what might have been, especially because with a book like Night of the Lonesome October, uh, Neil Gaiman said that at that point, at the very end of his career, that he was rediscovering his joy uh, in writing. And um, so, uh, so, yeah, yeah, it still, it still is, um, it's kind of hard to overstate the impact that his work has on the people who really love it. Arguably, that's true of any writer who's beloved, but it works in a certain way with Zelazny. In my own fiction, I've arguably spent my entire career just trying to write something that would affect anybody as strongly as the last sentence of A Rose for Ecclesiastes affected me the first time I read it. Yeah, and I I almost forgot to mention, I I noticed right before we started recording that today is actually Zelazny's birthday. It's by weird coincidence. Oh, wow. I didn't even realize that. Wow. So, um... I repeat, wow. (laughs) (laughs) And, yeah, I don't know if people know, but, you know, he he died when he was 58. You know, he died very young. And so he he would be 84 today. I know. Um, And you can just, yeah, you can just think of what how many things he, he would have written over the last 26 I know, years. I know. But you can also, uh, and also think, and this is again one of the many admirable things you find about him, is that he, he's unlike, try to kind of phrase this carefully, unlike many writers when they get to a certain point in their careers or of a certain age, he always stayed current with the field. And a lot of the friends he had in Santa Fe were people like Martin and Williams and people who were of the next generation from him. Um, And he was always aware of what was going on in the field and keeping up with things. So in addition to the stories that we might have had from him. I uh, would also uh, expect that he would find, you know, the things that have happened in the field in the last uh, 25 years to be well worth noticing and very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's actually, that's a really good note to end on. So um, why don't we wrap things up there? But okay. so um, I guess, Brett, do you have any, um, I guess, any other final thoughts or any other projects you're working on that you want to let people know about? <laughs> Uh, after a year of teaching during the pandemic, my main project this summer is to be, do as little as possible. <laughs> but uh, to, uh, I um, I want to get back to some fiction writing. Uh, I will say if anybody's interested in that aspect of things, the, the one story that I've published since my collection came out, uh, and that's uh, the, uh, the, um, the End of All Our Exploring from Fairwood Press, uh, is a story that's in an anthology called Portals, and it's called A Bend in the Air. And it's the, about the first story I wrote after basically wrapping up work on this Lasney book, and I found myself under the influence <laughs> when I was <laughs> writing that story. I like to think of, I refer to it as my sword and sorcery story, with no swords and very little sorcery, but um, if but if anybody's curious, that's in uh, the anthology portals um, from the marvelously named Zombies Need Brains uh, Press. 
Yeah, that's great. And I mean, I, I do really want to read your short story collection sometime. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always oh. want to talk more about Roger Zelazny. So oh, maybe we can no, 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 to... no. Oh, I would be more than happy to do this again. No, no. Uh, I uh, rest easy. Uh, I came into this to talk about Zelazny. Uh, that's <laughs> what I'm here. That's what I'm here for. And I really appreciate you giving me the chance to do that. And as for my collection, reading it or not reading it, uh, you could pave a highway from here to Montreal with the books I have not read. Not only can I not, I can't, I, not only can I not keep up with the field, I can't even keep up with my own friend's work <laughs> because they just keep writing. Yeah, but no, I, I would love to have you back sometime though. Okay. Um, Cause this has been, this has been super fun. Good. Um, so yeah, let's definitely do it again sometime. Uh -huh. And so we've been speaking with uh, F. Brett Cox, about his new book, Roger Zelazny, Modern Masters of Science Fiction. So, Brett, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, David. I really enjoyed it. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to F. Brett Cox for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Evan Geller for sponsoring today's show. Check out his new novel, God Bless the Dead, over at thegoatrodeoblog.com. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.